Good morning. <clears throat> That's better than church. Good morning. Okay, it's wonderful to be with you at the start of your day. You've just heard that I often uh, speak on the Today programme, so those of you who listen to that will know that this is a bit later than I normally speak. Um, and it may, for some of you, uh, I hope I'm not causing you too much trauma to some of you, because the sight of a religious person first thing in the morning might take you back to school assembly or uh, make you worry that I'm going to make you sing a hymn. <laughs> I'm not, maybe. But in a day about humanity and technology, I want to start the day with asking a question about the humanity bit. The question I'm asking you is, who are you at work? Who are you at work? Are you recognizable to the people who love you? Are you recognizable to yourself? Who are you at work? So the place that I uh, start these reflections is as a priest. I'm a vicar in the Church of England, and I live right here. In fact, I live about uh, 20 seconds from Piccadilly Circus. And because I've got a really childish sense of humor, when it's all kicking off and it's all a bit busy, I like to sit in my study and say, oh, it's like Piccadilly Circus around here. <laughs> um, here is a church building embedded in the city, surrounded by a huge number of other activities. You can see all the other buildings there. We're surrounded by private equity firms, by retail, by hospitality firms, by co-working spaces and art galleries. And there is actually an elite dating agency that operates just around the corner from us. By the way, the man who runs the elite dating agency says that the first thing he asks his new executive clients is whether they have time to do things for themselves, like have a hobby or go to the gym or cook. And if they don't, if all they do is work, then he tells them that they don't have time for a relationship and they should go away until they do. Just thought I'd pass a tip on if anyone's... <laughs> Most people, truthfully, live their lives without reference to religion. The chances are, in an audience of this size, most of you live your lives without reference to religion. I don't know when was the last time that you went inside a church or a mosque or a synagogue or a temple for an event or just to see it. That's for you to know, and I'm not going to ask you. I'm not here to talk about church. I'm not here to talk about religion. But I am here to talk about believing stuff. Who are you at work? Because the story of this slide, I want to try to help us imagine the story of our working environment and who we are at work by telling the story of this slide. The church, St. James's Piccadilly, is the oldest building in the area. And as well as being a place of worship, it has long been a place of work. <clears throat> Since 1684, when it was surrounded by fields, generations of people have worked at it as builders, as stonemasons, as carpenters, as caretakers, as social workers, as educators, as children's workers, of course, as priests. My assumption here is that we don't live so much in a secular society, although many people would describe it that way. I think we live in a credulous society, where people are prepared to believe, well, almost anything. We're more than ready to believe stuff if it fits in with our already preconceived ideas and beliefs about ourselves, about others, about our world, and about our work. Just last night on BBC Four, a man who was calling himself a liberal troll was demonstrating how to spread fictitious stories that would appeal to the alt-right. For example, last night, it was a fictitious story about Sharia law that was instantly picked up and shared with alarming speed. To me, that kind of trolling, that kind of information sharing, particularly online, says to me that we are ready to believe stuff especially if it fits in with our preconceived ideas. So my assumption is, not so much secular society, but credulous society. My assumption is that this room is full of beliefs, acknowledged or not. 
Like the church building here, our beliefs can look as if they've become surrounded by, even overwhelmed by, the variety of activities that we run around doing. By the way that you and I do our jobs, by the way that we build our teams, these tasks are influenced, whether we like it or not, by the things we believe about the way the world works. And testing those beliefs is a process that, in my experience, breathes new life into those teams, into methods of cooperation, and ultimately outcomes too. This particular church was built by Christopher Wren, one of the most amazing architects in the history of architecture. But he wasn't just an architect in the manner of the 17th century. He was also interested in astronomy. He built St. Paul's Cathedral, as I'm, no doubt some of you will know. And in St. Paul's Cathedral, although it, is, it never happened, he put space for a telescope in one of the towers because he thought, what, a better, what better place to scan the heavens than a church? In this church, we don't have much stained glass. That's good, because people like me have smashed a stained glass ceiling. <laughs> we don't have... <laughs> the old ones are the best. <laughs> This church doesn't have much stained glass because he believed that the light of reason should shine into religion. So we have clear glass. It's a light and breezy church space. So when we are practicing our religion, when we're saying our prayers, I can look out of the window and see the buses on Piccadilly. I can look out of the window and see the planes going past in the sky. He believed that sunlight was the best antiseptic for toxic religion and toxic beliefs. So this picture and this architecture for me is a metaphor for human life at work. I'm busy, I'm active, I'm productive, I've got all that activity going on, symbolized by the buildings around, the professional building blocks of my life. But there is somewhere deep inside me, inside you, a sacred space where my deeply held beliefs are kept. Just to reiterate, I'm not talking about religious beliefs, although they could be religious. I'm talking about deeply held beliefs that were born in me, like this church, before any of the other building blocks were built around it. What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about other people? Quite often, we carry around immutable beliefs about ourselves. I've never been any good at maths. I was thrown out of the choir at school. I like rock music, but I hate pop. Whatever it might be. What do you believe about other people? Do you experience the world as a fundamentally benign place, or other people, are other people there to be beaten and overcome? A member of my congregation introduced me to a new word recently. Josephine is 80-something, a Londoner born in Antigua. She experiences casual racism every day, and she has terrible stories to tell about the time she arrived in the UK in the 1950s. But recently, she wanted me to know her philosophy, and she introduced me to her word. She says she has pronoia, the fundamental belief that everyone out there is conspiring to help you. What do you believe about what your life is for? What's the purpose of your work? What do you believe about your own body? What do you believe about your spirit? Sometime today, write down, I believe in, and just see what you say. Sometime today, write down, I believe that, and see what you say. At their best, our beliefs can serve us well and keep us grounded. Because living our lives by the pace of the internet or by trying to keep up with the news, I think it's like trying to tell the time by looking at the second hand on a clock. 
You can tell the time by looking at the second hand on a clock in a way. It's truthful, but it's exhausting. At their best, living by our beliefs can be like living our lives by the hour hand on a clock. No less relevant or contemporary or now, it's still now, it's still accurate, but we live by a different rhythm and according to a different pace. Our unacknowledged beliefs can cause us harm, and if we exercise power at work, can cause harm to other people. For example, if we've experienced the world as a hostile place, and if we tend to come out fighting, this can erupt in any workplace, in any kind of grievance or disciplinary procedure. What do priests have to say about such things? Before I was at St. James's, I worked as a canon at St. Paul's Cathedral with an annual turnover of about 15 million pounds, with a huge dependency on tourist income. Now at St. James's in this London church, our turnover is of one million pounds. We essentially raise a million pounds and spend a million pounds every year, making small surpluses along the way, with 28 people on the payroll and an apprentice. Priests often work very closely with HR professionals in today's church on all the usual issues, such as redundancy, pay reviews, performance reviews, and so on. But as I've reflected on the nature of work and the character of workplaces, I know that so many people are lonely at work, sending emails to the person at the next desk rather than speaking to them. Many people, despite all the work environments with ping pong tables and dress down days, standing meetings and increased efficiency, many people feel unhappy. So the deeper questions persist. They don't go away. And so I want to open the door to the sacred, closely held beliefs that I have. And like Christopher Wren wanted me to, let the sunlight in and challenge myself test those beliefs. So I've learned a couple of things along the way, particularly as a woman in a male-dominated institution, for example, how to prepare for a meeting to find my own voice hasn't often meant to me getting more knowledge or more skill. It's been developing my character. And if I uh, go back to what I was doing before I was ordained. I was a singer, professional singer. I trained at the Royal College of Music, which is right next to this building. So what I do sometimes, if I'm preparing for a big moment at work, is I'll go and sing. Nothing religious. It's usually the way you look tonight. <laughs> I will sing in preparation for a big meeting. I will play chess in preparation for a strategy day. Part of what I'm saying is that the set of skills I need to do my work are of course important, and I can get training, and I do, but first and foremost, I'm a human being, not a human doing. I am, and that's important before I do. Psychologists tell me that in some ways I'm like every other person on the planet. I need water to survive. I need oxygen to live. I'm sometimes afraid to die. I wonder what life is all about. I'm like everybody else in this room. In other ways, I'm like some other people on the planet. I'm female. I speak some German. I have this shade of skin. I was born in the UK. I'm like some other people on the planet. And in a third category of ways, I am completely unique as you are. No one has the same fingerprint as me. No one has the same eye color or the same unique combination of experience, character, and knowledge. And so it helps me sometimes when I'm trying to discover my deeply held beliefs to recognize in which mode I am when I'm speaking to another person. Am I speaking to a person who's the same or different or as a unique person? If these beliefs are not known about at work, then I want to suggest that those of us who will be programming algorithms, either now or in the future, which isn't me, will be captured by our beliefs, good or bad. 
and the old injustices, the old inequalities, the old wasteful ways will be perpetuated by the repetition of past behaviours, which is all the evidence we have with which to programme those algorithms in the first place. And so I end with my thought for the day. Who are you at work? My suggestion at the beginning of this new day is to dare to open those doors of that sacred, protected space inside you where you believe your most precious things. And when imagining a better future, we are to give up all hope of a better past. We can't change it. But by talking about our beliefs and becoming deeply creative in challenging them, we generate hope and we know that our best days at work are yet to come. Thank you. Amazing. No worries. <laughs>Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think the, the applause will be justified, should show you how much of an impact that you had today. And I think the Today programme should pay you extra if they don't pay you already, <laughs> because there's a whole more, load of people who are going to come on to, to listen to more. We're, we're running slightly short of time, so we, we're, I'm going to steal uh, the floor and ask you a question. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, you've already had the line of the conference, breaking glass ceilings. I like that. I see what, I see what you did stained there. Stained glass ceilings. Stained glass. Come on, get it right, Tim. But essentially... I like you, he's domineering as well, I like this. Oh, I'm not going to move. Um, but essentially, you talked a lot about beliefs. Um, what is your belief about the impact that technology is going to have on our future environment? Because things are moving so quickly, and with a more secular society that some people were talking about, what's your hope around belief and technology? I think, uh, I mean, I think if we put our hope in technology, we're putting our hope in the wrong place. So hope is vested in people who then make the technology which will improve our lives. So I, I, I'm, I, I, love, I love technology. I think it's a really, it's an extraordinary expression of the creativity of people. Hmm. But ultimately, for me, the key task in helping algorithm programmers to do their job well is development of character and ethics alongside all the skills and knowledge that we need. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in my mind between knowledge and wisdom. And what we're going to need more than ever is wisdom how to, in terms of how to navigate the uh, kind of extraordinary pace of change that is going on now. And I think, you know, it's the old, it's the old ethical question. Just because we can, does it mean we should? Who is going to stop us? Who, who's going to stop that pace of change? Mm -hmm. I mean, probably answer nobody. But there are plenty of people who uh, developed a, a particular strand of technology or particular uh, discovery in science who later on, when they saw the application of that knowledge, uh, disavowed uh, it yeah. or stepped away from it. Yeah. And we can learn from, we can learn from that. Um, I was just uh, talking the other day about... Um, we're in, the, we're in the season of Lent in the Christian church, which is kind of fasting season. It's all about the desert. So the desert is a big metaphor. And we, I was talking about testing in the desert. Mm. So I talked about the first nuclear test in the desert. Robert Oppenheimer said later on, after the bombing of Nagasaki, that he wanted to have nuclear weapons banned. And he was the guy who right. oversaw the first nuclear test in the desert. So, you know, let's learn from the stories of those uh, people that, that, were, that were extraordinary people, but let's learn from the journey that we go on. So for me, in terms of humanity and technology, mm. the work has to be done with humanity, and all the, uh, all the other stuff then, we'll know what to do with the knowledge we have if we become wise. Humans being, Yes, not human doing. being, not human doing. Or human being first. Then, of course, do, I mean, doing is great, it's creative, fantastic. But if we, if we just get lost in all the doing, if that becomes how we get our own status, if that's how we really, really accept the person that we are or we get our own uh, confidence from just doing, we're, we're lost, we're lost. Well, thankfully, we have you, so we're not that lost <laughs> in the year. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah.